Book three, chapter twelve of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book three, chapter twelve. That was my true love's voice. Where is he? I heard him call. I am free. Nobody shall hinder me. I will fly to his neck and lie on his bosom. He called Margaret. He stood upon the threshold, in the midst, through the howling and chattering of hell, through the grim, devilish scoffing, I knew the sweet, the loving tone again. A spacious, old-fashioned mansion north of London, among the green by-roads between Barnet and Watford. A noble old house, red brick, of the Anne period, with centre and wings making three sides of a quadrangle a stately old house, lying remote from the high road, and surrounded by pleasure grounds and park, the latter somewhat flat and dreary, but on a high level, with glimpses of a fine landscape here and there, through a break in the wood. The house had belonged to a law lord of the Augustan age of good Queen Anne, a once famous law lord, whose portrait in wig and state robes looked down from the panelled walls, and with divers other effigies of his wife and children, went among the fixtures of the house, and was flung into the bargain on very easy terms, among crystal chandeliers, antique fenders and fire-irons, shutter-bells, and other conveniences of a bygone age. From the law-lord the mansion had descended to a wholesale grocer of the Sabalum type, who thought two puddings luxuries, and rolled ponderously to Mincing Lane every day in his glass coach. Then came an Anglo-Indian colonel, enriched by the plunder of silver-gated cities and Brahminical temples, who held high jinks in the old house, and ended by throwing himself from an upper window in a fit of delirium tremens. This helped to give the house a bad name, and together with its curiously isolated position, remote from all modes of conveyance, an extreme inconvenience in an age when everybody requires to be conveyed, tended to depress its market values, whereupon it was bought a dead bargain by a speculative solicitor, who tried to let it for some years without success, during which period the inhabitants of Heatherbridge, a little village half a mile distant, were confirmed in their convictions that Heatheridge Hall, the mansion in question, was the favourite resort of hags, ghosts and sprites that haunt the nights. In due time, however, the place came under the notice of Dr. Cameron, who, as his patients increased in number, required a larger mansion than that in which his father had begun business, and who, finding in Heatheridge and its hall a situation and an abode at once eligible and inexpensive, made haste to secure house and grounds on a long lease, getting the portraits of the law lord and his olive branches flung in for an old song, as well as grounds furnished with some of the finest specimens of the fir tribe in the county of Harts. So the noble music-room, where the bewigged and bepowdered family of the law lord smirked and simpered on the panelled walls, and where the law lord himself had entertained the elite of the countryside with stately old-fashioned hospitality, was now given up to the weekly junketings of ladies and gentlemen of more or less disordered intellect ladies upon whose headgear and gentlemen upon whose collars and cravats eccentricity had set its seal here once a week throughout the slow long winter the doctor's patients pranced and capered through first sets and lancers and caledonians while the younger and more fashionable among them even essayed round dances here in full view of those stately effigies of the patch and powder period mild refreshment in the way of white wine negus and raspberry jam tarts was dispensed between nine o'clock and ten when the junketers dispersed more or less unwillingly to their several chambers under close guard of nurses and keepers who drove them along passages and up staircases like a flock of sheep the traveller lingering a few moments by the park fence to look down the long straight avenue at the grim red façade of heatheridge hall was apt knowing the story of the place to fancy dire scenes of horror within those solid old walls secret dungeon chambers underground in which wretched creatures forgotten by all the world except one brutal guardian 
languished in sempiternal darkness chained to a damp black wall against which the slimy rats pushed noiselessly to fight for the madman's scanty meal dreary windowless rooms in the heart of the house approached by secret passages known of but by a few where pale white-haired women pined in a lifelong silence but there were neither robora nor piombi in dr cameron's prosperous and comfortable establishment and the only horrors within that melancholy mansion were the gloomy thoughts of those among its occupants who were not quite mad enough to be unconscious of their state or the black despair of those in whom madness was a thing of violence and terror a ceaseless fever of the brain like a cauldron for ever at boiling point full of fancies grim and loathsome as the constituents of a witch's hell-broth happily for the doctor there was a good deal of comfortable easy-going lunacy in his establishment patients who liked their dinner and kept up their spirits by quarrelling with each other and reviling their nurses some of these custodians were amiable young women enough and really kind to their charges but there was another class of attendants who finding life in an asylum rather a dull business took it out of the patients and acquired a diabolical skill in the administration of sly pinches and invisible squeezes in public while in private their mode of remonstrance with a refractory or fretful patient took the more open form of bangs and kicks any bruises or abrasions resulting from this rough and ready style of argument were easily accounted for as having been self-inflicted by the patient poor thing the doctor was a man of considerable benevolence who conducted his house on a liberal scale gave his patients airy rooms ample service and good living and only failed to secure them from the possibility of ill usage for the simple reason that he was not ubiquitous he did not live at hetheridge but drove down from the west end once or twice a week in his brougham saw a few particular cases smiled his soothing smile upon the victims of mental delusion dexterously fenced those strange direct questions which madness is apt to put to its guardian walked through the public rooms made a good many inquiries looked about him in a general way took a chop and a glass or two of dry sherry with his subordinate the medical superintendent at hetheridge and then went back to his metropolitan practice which was a large one in this strange abode elizabeth awoke one morning from a long troubled dream of swift journeying through the land bound like a captive in a corner of the railway carriage for had she not resisted this transit opposing her sudden removal from slogna dyack with what little force she had whereby the physician kindly as his nature was felt himself called upon to exercise his authority with a certain severity of aspect and to treat lady paulyn as a naughty child requiring nursery discipline darker than the darkest dream that ever visited the couch of fever was that rapid journey from north to south the swiftness of the transit was in itself an agony to that enfeebled brain the perpetual monotonous thump of the engine like the throbbing of some giant heart beating itself to death the ceaseless shifting of the landscape moor and mountain valley and wood flitting past behind the blinding rain like shadows moving in a phantom world all these things were torment to that distracted mind no warning of the impending journey had been given to the patient no hint of impending change in her mode of life for doctors and nurses alike concurred in treating her as if she had been a sick child from the hour in which hallucination set in this infantine treatment had been religiously observed the possibility of a bright intellect struggling in an agony of perplexed thought behind the dim clouds that obscured it was utterly ignored because the patient thought wrongly upon some points she was set down at once as incapable of reasonable thought upon any point left in the dismal blankness of isolation no friendly word whispered in her ear no tidings of the outer world permitted to dispute the dominion of wild imaginings her weakened brain had been wearied by perpetual wonder at her own state and why she was thus cut off from all communion with her kind on the morning of the journey she had been dressed like a child who is taken for an airing 
her travelling dress hustled upon her by the nurse's impatient hands dragged down the stairs against her will protesting vehemently in wildest despair as if moved by some prophetic sense of impending doom then came a dreamlike apathy in which thought was not only the acute agony of shattered nerves for some time after her arrival at heatherbridge park lady paulyn was pronounced unfit for the social circle as there represented by a small assemblage of ladies and gentlemen of various habits and opinions whom the world as represented by doctors and commissioners of lunacy had agreed in pronouncing of unsound mind they were not on the whole wildly different from other ladies and gentlemen nor did their lunacy exhibit those salient points which afforded material for the pen of a warren or a gilbert in fact they did little to distinguish themselves from the vulgar herd of the sane they were a shade more disagreeable than the outside world or exhibited their various ill tempers more freely grumbled a great deal upon every possible subject and each pursued his or her line of thought without reference to external circumstances with a harmless egotism not uncommon even in the outer world but to those specimens of the later stage of dr cameron's process which were in a manner the bedded out plants of his collection removed from the forcing house or the hotbed of solitary confinement into the open lady paulyn was not yet considered fit to be introduced such at least was the opinion of dr cameron and the house surgeon who took their opinions from the nurses their own visits to lady paulyn's rooms only showed them a motionless figure in an armchair with pale dejected face and loosened hair tossed back from a weary-looking brow a haggard face and wild tearless eyes which gazed at them wonderingly out of a dream world the system in this case was naturally the system usual in all other cases what physician could chop and change his treatment to suit the idiosyncrasies of every new patient the same soothing smile which dr cameron like the sun which shines alike upon the just and the unjust shared upon the crazy stockbroker whose mental balance had tottered in unison with his balance at his bankers under the cumulative burden of contango he shed also upon lady paulyn the gentle gesture with which he smoothed the roughened locks of the wealthy grocer's wife who had succumbed to a too devoted attention to the wine and spirit department of her husband's business was the same touch half patronising half caressing which he laid like a good man's blessing upon elizabeth's fevered forehead he had even a little sympathetic murmur a faint humming as of a benevolent bee which he bestowed alike upon all first-class patients he perhaps hummed a trifle less for the second-class boarders but even for them he had kindly pitying smiles but always as of a superior order of being whose brain had been constructed upon quite another model and was altogether a different kind of machine not by any possibility to be disorganised dr cameron devoting five minutes twice a week or so to this very interesting case was greeted by the patient only with a despairing silence and mute wondering looks from troubled eyes wonder at this period predominating over every other sensation wonder why she was in that place why he malcolm had so utterly deserted her why all her surroundings had undergone a change so sudden and complete that it seemed to her as if she was an infant newly born into a new world wonder which was mute for when she tried to speak strange words came and the power of language seemed to have left her except in spasmodic outbursts of complaint complaint addressed to the bare walls or to her adamantine nurses dr cameron seeing her in this state and being duly informed by loquacious nurses that lady paulyn was violent and hysterical began to think the chances of a speedy cure more than doubtful the patient talked to herself a great deal her nurses told him and obstinately refused to sleep in which peculiar temper she was the worst subject they had ever had to deal with we don't get a wink of sleep for hours at a stretch complained nurse barber of the grenadier aspect talking to herself all night long drumming with her fingers on the wall and that restless 
turn and turn and toss and toss from side to side and sigh and moan in a way that goes to your very marrow i think for troublesomeness she's about the worst patient i ever laid eyes on oh, does she ever speak of her husband now asked the doctor inquiring for some token of awakening memory oh lord bless you no sir and if we say anything about him stands us out up hill and down dale that there's no such person and she was never married once when i mentioned his name thinking as that might bring her to reason she looked round at me with a foolish smile twisting and untwisting her hair round her fingers all the time and said oh poor lord paulyn yes he was in love with me once poor fellow but that's all over i was true to malcolm as to the way she carries on about that malcolm it's downright wicked so dr cameron looked kindly at the troublesome patient hummed and hard a little in his mild way which meant that he could make nothing of her murmured something professional to himself about cerebral disturbance like a clock which strikes in an empty room from the mere habit of striking and departed knowing just as much about that curious mystery the human mind in this case as he knew in the case of the drunken grocer's wife or the demented stock jobber prescribing almost exactly the same treatment with a little difference as to diet perhaps since this was a more delicate organization wissilon instead of bottled stout the breast of a chicken instead of a rump steak he departed and left elizabeth in the utter darkness of a lonely room and in the power of nurses she abhorred the lottery of nurses is not unlike that lottery to which some atrabilious misogynist has compared to marriage it is like dipping for a single eel in a bag of snakes elizabeth's first draw had resulted in snakes her two nurses were first the grenadier woman with the muscles of a gladiator not a badly disposed person perhaps could one have arrived at the motive principle of her nature but using her enormous strength half unconsciously and having a fixed opinion that physical force was the only treatment for a mind askew secondly a vain pretty girl who enjoyed a flirtation with a keeper or gentlemanly lunatic on the high road to recovery better than the solitude of the patient's chamber who adopted the position of madhouse nurse because it paid better than pleasanter modes of industry and who wreaked her disgust for her calling upon the subject of her care she was morally worse than the grenadier heartless and shallow beyond all measure and maliciously gratified at having a lady at her mercy thus followed the long days and the longer nights nights for the greater part utterly without sleep long watches in the dim light of the night-lamp watches through which all the imps and demons of madness held their horrid sabbath in that one unresting brain nights in which the patient's mind was like a rudderless ship driven thousands of miles out of her course or like a star that has been loosed from its natural station in heaven to reel tempest-driven through infinite space who dare follow the thoughts of that distracted brain the inextricable tangle of waking dreams and shreds of memory going back to childhood's cloudiest recollections of a world that seems sweeter than the world known in later years nor were those silent nights voiceless for her voices that she loved spoke to her from the corridor outside her door only divided from her by that fatal locked door sometimes it was her mother's gentle half plaintive tone as of one who had always found life a thing to grumble at sometimes her baby's tiny voice calling with his first broken word the tender cry she had been so proud to hear sometimes her father's genial tones for in this long dream of madness death was not but oftenest of all came the voice of malcolm ford he was always near her shielding and consoling her there were nights when he would not speak but she was not the less convinced of his presence she knelt by that cruel door in the dead of the night while the nurses stretched grimly on their truckle beds kept guard over her as they slept 
and she laid her head against the panel and felt that her loved ones were near her felt as if their very breath shed a gentle warmth through the magnetic wood and melted the ice at her heavy heart she was as certain of their vicinity as she had ever been of any fact in her life she never doubted never questioned how they had come there wondered at nothing except why she was separated from them and this severance she came by and by to ascribe to the settled enmity of her nurses with the grey light of morning that dream would vanish and give place to another fancy or sometimes to a period of dull apathy an absolute blank in which perhaps the brain rested after its nightly fever she was quiet enough in the day the nurses admitted to each other whereby they contrived to steal various hours for their own amusements gossip or flirtation as the case may be while the patient sat alone and stared at the fire whose dangerous properties were guarded by a large wire screen against this screen elizabeth leant and looked into the fire which seemed the most sympathetic thing in her narrow world and struck wild chords on the wires of the guard and imagined the music that should have answered to her touch or even played some simple melody of days gone by vedre carino o voi ce sapete no one essayed to help her back to sense and memory the doctors came and looked at her and patted her on the head and passed from before her sight like the shifting shadows of a magic lantern and had about as much meaning for her no one tried to awaken her senses from their long dreams with books or genial talk with music or pictures or flowers or any of those familiar things that might have touched the mystic chords of memory there was a certain routine for all patients at heatheridge hall where madness was cured or taken care of upon a wholesale system not admitting of minute differences a comfortable open carriage was maintained for the use of the first-class patients and these when pronounced well enough for such indulgence were allowed to commune with nature daily during an hour's drive generally on the same turnpike road a glimpse of the outer world which raised strange vague longings in some distracted minds while for other more sluggish spirits the wide wintry landscape and the distant dome of st paul's seen dimly athwart a blue-grey cloud seemed no more than a picture flashed before their troubled eyes a picture of fields and hedgerows and sky and cloud dimly remembered in some former stage of existence during the first six weeks of her residence at heatheridge time of which the patient herself kept no count but which seemed rather a vast blank interval a dismal pause wherein life came to a standstill than so many days and nights lady paulyn was pronounced too weak for out-of-door exercise of any kind whatsoever and in this period she scarcely saw the sky it was there certainly the blue vault of heaven visible from the upper part of her window the lower half being kept closely shuttered lest she should do herself a mischief for nurse barber remembered and dwelt upon that little episode at slognadiac when she had sought to force herself out of the window the sky was there within reach of her dull eyes and she did not look up at it her brain was a medley of old thoughts a chaos of many-coloured scraps and shreds like a good housekeeper's rag-bag all her married life with its social triumphs its unbroken brilliancy its splendour and extravagance was as if it had never been and young memories childish fancies and the days when her first and only love ripened into passion usurped her mind madness which in its worst folly has a curious tendency to hit upon universal truths revealed the unquenchable power of a first poetic love a love which pure as the vestal sacred fire burns with its quiet light through all the storms of life and grows brighter as the pilgrim's path descends the valley where the shadows thicken on the borderland of life and death end of book three chapter twelve Book Three, Chapter Thirteen of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book 3, Chapter 13 Hast thou no care of me? Shall I abide in this dull world, which in thy absence is no better than a sty? Tonga Tabu and Tahiti, or the Tonga Tabu and Tahiti of the day, had to wait the return of their pastor. Savage chieftains, holding counsel in the domestic seclusion of their matting with their wives and families, could but lament the absence of that white-skinned teacher whom at his first coming they had been disposed to treat as a god. That autumn tide did not see Malcolm Ford's return to the South Sea Islands. For a little while, at least, even duty must be in abeyance. His place must wait for him. The society for which he had worked knew him well enough to know that he was thoroughly in earnest, that he would return in due time, and complete the labour he had begun, and widen the area of his labours, and faint not until death should say to him, Thus far, and no farther shalt thou journey, O pilgrim and messenger. Meanwhile, he stayed in England to do something very near his heart, to watch and pray for the woman he loved, and whom, as it seemed, all the world except himself had abandoned to bitterest fate. But for him, Gertrude Luttrell would have yielded helplessly, nervelessly, almost placidly, to the force of circumstances, would have meekly accepted the fact that her sister had been transferred to a lunatic asylum as a melancholy necessity, against which there could be no appeal, beyond which there could be but the smallest margin for hope. But Malcolm Ford was not inclined to take things so patiently. He came straightway to London with Miss Luttrell, saw Mrs. Chevenix, whose malady, a chronic neuralgia, seemed hardly so severe or tangible an affliction as to justify her refusal to come to her niece's rescue, and who, in this sad crisis of her favourite niece's life, had little help of any kind to offer, and seemed chiefly tormented by a melancholy foreboding that it, uh, meaning Elizabeth's madness, would get into the papers. "'Oh, everything does get into the papers sooner or later,' she said despondently. "'I am sure there's no such thing as the sanctity of private life for people of position. "'I shall never take up my morning post without a shudder from this time forward.' "'Had we not better think of how we are to save your niece from the anguish of her present situation, "'rather than of keeping the fact out of the morning post?' said Mr. Ford. "'It might be necessary even for us to appeal to the press for help, "'if we found no other way of rescuing her.' "'Oh, Mr. Ford,' moaned Mrs. Chevenix, applying herself mechanically to her scent-bottle, Oh, don't pray talk about the anguish of her situation. We have no reason to suppose that she's unhappy. With my nephew Lord Paulyn's splendid income, she would, of course, be sure of the very highest form of treatment, every advantage which wealth could provide. We will take that for granted, if you like. But she is in the hands of strangers, and even her sister does not know where or with whom. The fitful fever of the brain, which succeeded fever of the body, has been set down as madness, and in that state of mental exaltation, every sense intensified, her capacity for suffering increased twentyfold, she has been handed over to strangers, whose interest will be best served by her permanent estrangement. Say that they are conscientious and will do their best to cure her. Will the best they can do counterbalance the horror of that sudden removal to an entirely strange place, and the banishment of every human creature, and every object with which she was familiar? Is not such a shock eminently calculated to turn temporary hallucination into lifelong madness? I am almost distracted when I think of what's been done, cried Malcolm, starting from his chair and pacing the Eaton Place drawing-room, the room which seemed destined only to witness his misery. Mrs. Chevenix sighed, and again sought relief from the scent-bottle, first from one end and then the other, as if in aromatic vinegar there might lurk a virtue that was not in sal volatile. 
the first thing to be done said malcolm coming to a standstill by the writing-table at which gertrude sat helpless those perpetual tears standing in her eyes she had done nothing but shed those two slow languid tears since she left slognadiac as if having produced these silent evidences of feeling she had done her duty to her sister the first thing to be done is for miss luttrell to write to lord paulyn requesting to be immediately informed of the place to which her sister has been taken and the people to whom she has been entrusted you had better write the letter in duplicate miss luttrell and address one copy to park lane and the other to slognadiac miss luttrell endeavoured to obey with a sheep-like meekness but finding herself absolutely incapable of framing a sentence mr ford himself dictated the letter which was brief and decisive ending with the formal request be good enough to telegraph an immediate reply it was also at mr ford's suggestion that miss luttrell took up her abode in her aunt's house until such time as she should be better informed about her sister's fate having done this and feeling with supreme pain that there was little more he could do mr ford went to his solicitor in lincoln's inn fields and took counsel with him upon the legal aspect of lady paulyn's position the lawyer's opinion was not particularly cheering elizabeth's husband was her natural guardian with the sanction of the commissioners in lunacy he could place her in whatever licensed establishment he pleased her sisters and her aunt counted for very little in her life no reply to gertrude's letter came in the shape of a telegram but three days after the letter had been sent days of intolerable length for malcolm ford there came a curt scrawl from the viscount informing his dear miss luttrell that lady paulyn had been placed in the care of dr cameron of chesterfield row and heatheridge hall hearts that it was quite impossible she could be in better hands and that having already suffered so much trouble and annoyance from this unhappy event he must request that no further letters might be addressed to him on this subject he was on the point of starting for rome where he meant to winter his native country having become obnoxious to him the letter was full of his lordship's personal grievance and contained not one affectionate or compassionate allusion to his wife it contained however all that malcolm ford wanted to know the name of the doctor and the madhouse he made gertrude accompany him to chesterfield row within half an hour of the receipt of the letter he had taken up his quarters for a few days with an old friend in cadogan place in order to be within five minutes walk of mrs chevenix's house and had stipulated that a messenger should bring him immediate tidings of lord paulyn's reply thus it was that so little time was lost between the arrival of the letter and their interview with lady paulyn's physician dr cameron was kindness itself smiled his sweet smile upon gertrude and her clerical friend and pledged himself to do all that he could do in reason but really what you ask for mr mr ford with a glance at the cards that had been sent in to him is quite out of the question i can perfectly understand miss luttrell's natural desire to see her sister but an interview in the present stage of affairs is simply impossible yet is it not possible dr cameron that the sight of some one whom she has known and loved all her life a familiar home face bringing back old memories might strike a chord oh my dear sir exclaimed the doctor in his blandest way that is the very thing we want to avoid there must be no chords struck yet awhile the instrument is not strong enough to bear the shock it is all very well on the stage or in a novel we are told to believe that a favourite melody is played a familiar face is seen and the patient gives a shriek and recovers his senses in a moment on the spot my dear sir there is no such thing possible mental aberration without positive change in the condition of the brain is a thing of the rarest occurrence we have to cure the brain which we can neither see nor handle just as we set a broken arm which we can do what we like with 
and the first and most essential step towards recovery is repose absolute rest you will understand therefore my dear miss luttrell why i am compelled to forbid any intrusion upon the tranquil solitude in which our dear patient is now placed how soon may i see her asked gertrude oh that is a question beyond my power to answer all must depend upon her progress toward recovery if she recovers which i trust which i venture to say i believe she ultimately will i shall be happy to let you see her directly i find her mind strong enough to bear the emotion that must be caused by such a meeting i will not ask you to wait till she is really well for naturally that will be an affair of time and at the best rather a long time but as soon as the brain begins to regain its balance concurrently with the return of bodily strength you shall be allowed to see her lord paulyn who is naturally as anxious as yourself has resigned himself to the inevitable and submits to my judgment in this sad affair <laughs> he is so far resigned said mr ford with some touch of bitterness that he contemplates going abroad and putting the channel between himself and his afflicted wife oh a step i myself recommended replied dr cameron lord paulyn has been rather severely shaken by this business and as he is of an excitable temperament the consequences to himself might not be without peril the conversation lasted some time longer mr ford was not easily satisfied he tried to obtain some definite expression of the physician's opinion but physicians are not given to definite opinions dr cameron seesawed the matter in his most delicate way said all that was kind about lady paulyn persuaded miss luttrell that the best thing she could possibly do would be to go back to devonshire and there quietly wait for tidings of her sister's recovery and then politely dismissed his visitors who had really usurped a good deal of his valuable morning while patients with fees neatly papered in their waistcoat pockets were yawning over a three weeks old illustrated london news or a year old quarterly gertrude left chesterfield row sorely dejected in mind and disposed to take the doctor's advice and go straight back to the little house in the borough bridge road where bright fenders and fire-irons and polished tables would be going to rack and ruin in the absence of her supervising eyes she of old so strong-minded seemed to have become the weakest and most helpless of womankind it isn't as if i could be of any good to elizabeth she said if i could help her in any way i shouldn't care what sacrifices i made but dr cameron says i may have to wait for months before he can let me see her and what will become of the house all that time with only diana and blanche who have no more idea of looking after things than if they were infants we shall all be ruined if i don't go back soon and when you're gone back if your sister were dying and dr cameron at the last moment awoke to the idea that she should have someone near her whom she loved you will be in devonshire too far to be summoned in time to be of any use Oh, but she's not going to die cried gertrude with a frightened look dr cameron said nothing about her dying not directly but he said she was in a very weak state of health and a physician seldom says quite all he means i have seen her remember and the change i saw in her was enough to put sad forebodings in my mind oh god to think of her alone in a madhouse he cried with a little burst of passion brightest creature that ever lived upon this earth but they will take the utmost care of her said gertrude tremulously and with a faint pang of envy envying elizabeth even now because malcolm ford had loved her still loved her perhaps for was not this keen anxiety more than simple christian charity dr cameron told us that and she will have every comfort every luxury a carriage at her disposal when she's well enough to use it every comfort every luxury 
do you think your sister cares for comforts and luxuries in a prison her proud free spirit might have found happiness on a desert island bondage has strangled it the bondage of a fatal marriage and now the bondage of a madhouse gertrude when i think of the past i'm almost mad if i had not been the proudest fool that ever lived all this might have been prevented oh, my darling he murmured softly that bright mind should never have gone astray had i the keeping of it he grew calmer presently and discussed things quietly with gertrude who shamed out of her small worldliness by his deeper feeling agreed to remain in eton place so long as aunt chevenix would shelter her there or if need were to take a modest lodging nearer her sister's prison-house and to let fenders fire-irons and even the family tea-kettle enfolded in baize and cunningly secreted under the best bed take care of themselves End of book three chapter thirteen book three chapter fourteen of strangers and pilgrims by mary elizabeth braddon this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book 3, Chapter 14 Did I speak once angrily, all the drear days you lived, you woman I loved so well, who married the other? Blame or praise, where was the use then? Time would tell, and the end declare what man for you what woman for me was the choice of god through the dull days of november into the dreary midwinter malcolm ford lived in the little village of heatheridge and in his lonely walks every day and often twice a day beheld the walls that shut elizabeth from all the outer world christmas had come and gone a strangely quiet christmas and he had not yet seen dr cameron's patient though he had been favoured with several brief interviews with the doctor who had cheered him lately with the intelligence that all was going well there had been lately decided signs of improvement the patient had been allowed to mingle a little with the sanest among her fellow patients had assisted at their little weekly dance though that modest festival had not appeared to make much impression upon her she had stared at the long lighted music-room and the people dancing in smartened morning dress and various coloured gloves wonderingly and had asked if it were a servant's ball but she had latterly been more amenable to reason the nurses complained less of her violence she had been taken for an airing in the grounds on fine days and would go out in the carriage as soon as the weather grew a little milder altogether the account was cheering and mr ford was fain to be satisfied and to thank god for so much mercy in answer to his prayers he was not quite idle even at heatheridge but had made friends with the incumbent of the little rustic church and helped him with his duty and made himself an awakening influence even in this narrow circle he visited the poor and catechised the children on sunday afternoons and very much lightened the burden of the perpetual curate of heatheridge who was an elderly man with chronic asthma this work and long hours of quiet study deep into the winter's night made his life tolerable to him made it easy to wait and watch and hope for the hour of elizabeth's recovery and when she would have recovered what then why then she would go back to her husband and to her old worldly life most likely and grow weary of it again no he would not believe this he would hope that by god's blessing this dismal warning would not have been sent in vain that she would begin an entirely new life a life of unselfishness and good works a life brightened by faith and prayer a life which should be her apprenticeship to christianity her education for the world to come this was what he hoped for this was the end to which he looked forward after that blessed day when she should stand before him in her right mind this consummation seemed to be a little nearer by and by 
when dr cameron said that if miss luttrell would procure a line from lord paulyn giving his consent to an interview with the patient he the doctor would sanction such an interview in the course of the following week do you mean to say that it's necessary to obtain lord paulyn's consent before his afflicted wife can be allowed to see her own sister her nearest surviving relative asked malcolm with a touch of indignation oh, unquestionably my dear sir answered the doctor lord paulyn placed this dear lady in my care and i have no right to permit her to see any one even her nearest of kin until i am certain of his approval the bond between man and wife my dear sir as i need hardly suggest to a gentleman of your sacred calling is above all other ties yes and as interpreted by the common law of england is sometimes a curious bondage said mr ford bitterly separating a woman from all that was dear to her in the past encompassing her life with a boundary which no one shall cross let her suffer what she may except her sufferings assume that special shape which the makers of the divorce law have taken into consideration thus a man may break his wife's heart but must not break her bones in the presence of witnesses lord paulyn has been a most devoted husband i believe said dr cameron with a disapproving air oh i have no reason to believe otherwise only it seems rather hard that your patient cannot see her sister without her husband's permission it is taking no account of all her past life and there may be some delay in obtaining this consent unless you can give miss luttrell her brother-in-law's address lord paulyn was in rome when i last heard from him replied dr cameron with an agreeable recollection of his lordship's communication which had been merely an envelope enclosing a cheque if it will save miss luttrell trouble i shall be happy to write to him myself of course such an appeal to his wishes is a mere point of ceremony but one which i feel myself bound to observe you are very good yes if you will write i am sure miss luttrell will be obliged to you it was settled therefore that dr cameron should apply for the required permission and gertrude must await the answer to his letter however tardily lord paulyn might reply the week spoken of by the physician came and went and he acknowledged that the patient was now well enough to see her sister but there was no answer from rome the viscount had gone else whither perhaps and the doctor's letter was following by the slow foreign stages this delay seemed a hard thing to malcolm ford almost harder to bear than the long period of doubt and fear when at each new visit to the physician he had dreaded to hear the patient pronounced incurable now when god had given her back to them for these first slow signs of improvement he accepted as the promise of speedy cure man interposed with his petty forms and ceremonies and said she shall languish alone the slow dawn of sense shall show her nothing but strange faces the first glimmer of awakening reason shall find her in loneliness and abandonment the first thought her mind shall shape shall be to think herself forgotten by all her little world put away from them like a leper to live or die as god pleases without their love or help it was in vain that he pleaded to dr cameron i would rather wait for the letter the kind-hearted physician said in his mild gentlemanly-like way a little delay will do no harm the mind is certainly recovering its balance and i hope great things from the return of mild weather i have given lady paul in new apartments though small changes are sometimes beneficial and a piano the exciting tendency of music was a point to be avoided until now and i have changed her nurses poor thing she fancied the last were unkind the merest delusion as they were women of the highest character and peculiarly skilled in their avocation 
another week went by and there was still no communication from lord paulyn dr cameron had written again at mr ford's earnest request and gertrude had also written but there was no answer to either letter malcolm ford paced the lonely road outside the fences of heatheridge park for hours together in the dull february afternoons saw the firelight shining from the distant windows of the hall which looked a comfortable mansion as its many lattices shone out upon the wintry dusk a mansion in which one could fancy happy home-like scenes the patter of childish feet on polished oak staircases fresh young voices singing old ballads in the gloaming lovers snatching brief glimpses of paradise in shadowy corridors from the light touch of a little hand or the shy murmur of two rosy lips all sweet things that wait upon youth and hope and love instead of madmen's disjointed dreams and the tramping to and fro of weary feet that know not whither they would go he could only watch and wait and hope and pray pray that the return of reason might restore her to peace and a calmer loftier frame of mind than she had ever known yet for his own part he had never even hinted a wish to see her indeed he did hardly desire to see that too lovely face again most lovely to him even in its decay it would be enough for him to hear of her from gertrude enough for him to have secured her the consolation of a sister's companionship and by and by when she was restored to health and released from her captivity a captivity which should not last an hour longer than was necessary dr cameron assured him he could go back to his distant vineyard with his soul at peace in the meantime it was his duty to watch for her and care for her as a brother might have done end of book three chapter fourteen Book Three, Chapter Fifteen of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book Three, Chapter Fifteen. Look on me. There is an order of mortals on the earth who do become old in their youth and die ere middle age without the violence of warlike death some perishing of pleasure some of study some worn with toil some of mere weariness some of disease and some insanity and some of withered or of broken hearts for this last is a malady which slays more than are numbered in the lists of fate taking all shapes and bearing many names elizabeth was better the time had come when she could shape her thoughts into words when dr cameron's kind face smiling gently at her had become something more than a picture when it had ceased also to recall to her first one person and then another faintly remembered among the hazy crowd of former acquaintance the people she had known in the park lane period of her life the time had come at last when she knew him as her custodian though why he should be so she knew not nor yet the meaning of her imprisonment but he seemed to her a person in authority and to him she appealed against her nurses telling him that they had been cruel to her more cruel than words could speak especially her words poor soul which came tremulously from the pale lips and were apt to shape disjointed phrases the nurses strenuously denied the truth of this accusation whereupon dr cameron gently shook his head as who would say poor soul poor soul we know how much significance to attach to her complaints but we may as well humour her so nurse barber and nurse lucas were passed on to another patient in the preliminary and violent stage and Lady Paulyn was now so fortunate as to be committed to the care of a soft-hearted, low-voiced little woman who had none of the vices of the Gamp sisterhood. This change, and a change in her apartments to rooms with a southern aspect, looking out upon a flower-garden, produced a favourable effect. The patient began to sleep a little at night, awoke from wild dreams of the past, recognised the blank, lonely present, and knew that she was severed from all she had ever loved knew that her dead were verily dead 
and that the voices she had heard in all those long winter nights had been only dream voices memory was slow to return and the power of consecutive thought ideas flashed across her brain like lightning and ideas that were for the greater part false her mind was like a diamond cut crystal reflecting gleams of many-coloured light or like a kaleidoscope in which thought was for ever running from one form into another her brain was never quiet it thought and thought and invented and imagined but rarely remembered or only remembered the remote past and even in those memories fact was mixed with fiction books that had impressed her long ago were as much a portion of her life as the actual events of the past and even in her broken memories of books imagination bewildered and deceived her there were poems of byron's the joueur and the prisoner of chillon which in her girlhood she had been able to repeat from the first line to the last she could remember a line here and there now and murmured it to herself sadly again and again and out of this grew a fancy that she'd known byron that she'd met him when the white-sailed bark that held genius and shelley vanished from the storm-swept waters this and a hundred other such fancies filled her brain she left off thinking of malcolm ford to think of beings she had never known creatures of her wild imagining left to the companionship of a nurse whose ideas rarely soared above the question of turning a last winter's gown or putting new ribbon on an old bonnet invention supplied the place of society she conversed with phantoms held mysterious communion with shadows were there not people outside her window for whom she had a secret code of signals did she not laugh to herself sometimes at the thought of how she cheated her guardians sometimes she was gay with a feverish gaiety at other times melancholy to despair weeping a rain of tears without knowing why she wept dr cameron being informed of these melancholy fits suggested that she should mix more freely with the other patients that she should spend an hour or two in the drawing-room with the milder cases and even attend the weekly soirees and derive gladness from the lancers and caledonians so one sunny morning when the aspect of nature even in her winter garment was cheerful lady paulyn's nurse led her down to the drawing-room and left her there alone on an ottoman near the fireplace while all the milder cases stared at her with a dreamy indifferent stare but not without some glimmer of sane superciliousness the drawing-room was long and spacious with a fireplace at each end oak panelling and family portraits a room that did really seem a little too good even for the milder cases who were hardly up to oak panelling or the sir joshua reynolds school of portraiture the windows were high and wide and the sun shone in on the scattered figures not grouped about either of the fireplaces but scattered about the length and breadth of the room each as remote as possible from her companions and all idle there they sat solitary among numbers all staring straight before them after that one brief survey of elizabeth some talking to themselves in a dreary monotonous way others silent elizabeth looked around her wonderingly what were they guests in a country house what a strange look they had dressed not unlike other people with faces like the faces of the rest of womankind so far as actual features went and yet with so curious a stamp upon every countenance and every figure and some minute eccentricity in every dress and then that low sullen muttering solitary looking women complaining to themselves in a hopeless subdued manner then suddenly that low sound of complaint swelled to a little burst of clamour half a dozen shrill voices raised at the same instant a discordant noise as of cats quarrelling which was hushed as suddenly at the behest of a clever-looking little woman dressed in black who walked quickly up and down the room remonstrating there was an open piano by the fireplace elizabeth sat down before it presently and began to play dreamily as if awakening reason found a vague voice in music but she had hardly played a dozen bars when a tall gaunt-looking woman in brown and yellow came up to her and pulled her away from the piano 
i'll have no more of your noise she said you're always at it and i won't stand it any longer but i never saw you before to-day pleaded elizabeth looking at her with innocent wondering eyes eyes that had grown childlike in that long slumber of the mind i can't have annoyed you before to-day stuff and nonsense you have annoyed me you're a detestable nuisance i won't have that piano touched first and foremost it's my property come come mrs sloper said the little woman in black who occupied the onerous post of matron in this part of the establishment you mustn't be naughty you've been very naughty all this morning and i shall really have to complain to mr burley mr burley was the resident medical man a gentleman who enjoyed the privilege of daily intercourse with the cases and had to do a good deal of mild flirtation with the first-class lady patients each of whom fancied she had a peculiar right to the doctor's attention elizabeth wondered a little to hear a broad-shouldered female on the wrong side of forty reproved for naughtiness in the kind of tone usually addressed to a child of six it was strange but no stranger than the rest of her new life there were some books on the table by the fireplace the first books she had seen since her illness she seized upon them eagerly and began to turn the leaves and look at the pictures they seemed to speak to her to be full of secret messages from someone she had loved who was it she had once loved so dearly she couldn't even remember his name oh mamma 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 moaned a lady in an armchair on the opposite side of the hearth a middle-aged lady stout of build with pepper and salt coloured hair neatly plaited and tied up with brown ribbons in the street door knocker style like a schoolgirl's oh mamma mamma she moaned lifting her voice with every repetition of her cry take me home to my mamma miss chiffinch said the matron you really must not go on so you disturb everybody and it is exceedingly silly to talk like that your mamma has been dead for the last twenty years you fool replied miss chiffinch with ineffable scorn as if i didn't know that as well as you and then resumed her cuckoo cry oh mamma mamma one young woman with straight brown hair hanging down her back walked about the room in a meandering sort of way trying to fasten herself upon somebody like the boy who wanted the brute creation to play with him and like that idle child was rejected by all she came up to elizabeth presently as if hoping to obtain sympathy from a new arrival my sisters are so happy she said so happy they're all at home and they do enjoy themselves so they're as happy as the day is long don't you think they'd let me go home i do want to go home my sisters are so happy why don't you try to employ yourself miss pocock demanded the busy little matron who was always knitting a stocking and whose needles flew as she walked up and down the room or remonstrated with her charges you'd get well again soon if you tried to do something i'll give you some plain work if you like anything would be better than roaming about like that worrying everybody oh mrs darlings do let me go home pleaded miss pocock in her drawling tone my sisters are so happy oh dear mr burley this with a little gush as she espied the house doctor entering by a door near at hand oh do let me go home i'll be so grateful and i'll be so good to father and never be troublesome any more my sisters are so happy you should have behaved better when you were at home said mr burley with friendly candour there go along as miss pocock hung upon his arm affectionately and try to get well get some needlework and sit down and keep yourself quiet with this scientific advice mr burley walked on and looked at the other patients with a cool cursory glance at each as if they'd been a flock of sheep and he their shepherd only wanted to assure himself he had the right number this was the ladies drawing-room the gentlemen had their own apartments in the east wing 
the second-class patients male and female had their apartments in the west wing and there were private sitting-rooms in abundance for patients not well enough or quiet enough for general society the majority of these drawing-room cases were old stagers people who had been in dr cameron's care for years and were likely to end their lives contentedly enough perhaps despite that chronic moaning under his roof they were well fed and living thus publicly under the matron's eye were not much subject to the dominion of cruel nurses they had comfortable rooms good fires weekly hijinks in the winter little dances on the lawn in the summer an annual picnic and in short such small solace as humanity could devise and the slow dull lives they led here could hardly have been much slower or duller than the lives which some people in their right mind lead by choice in a country town elizabeth looked at her fellow patients in a dreamy way turned the leaves of the books reading a few lines here and there the words always assuming a kind of hidden meaning for her as if they had been mystic messages intended for her eyes alone but when the book was closed she had no memory of anything she had read in it she dined with the milder cases male and female in the public dining-room at the request of mr burley who wanted to see the effect of society even such society as that as an awakening influence here the cases behaved tolerably enough though exhibiting the selfishness of poor humanity with an amount of candour which does not obtain in the outside world there was a good deal of grumbling about the viands chiefly in an undertone and the patients were perpetually remonstrating with the serving-man who administered to their wants and who had rather a hard time of it there were even attempts at conversation mr burley saying a few words in a brisk business-like way now and then at his end of the table and the matron politely addressing her neighbours at her end one elderly gentleman with a limp white cravat and watery blue eyes fixed upon elizabeth and favoured her with an exposition of his theological views you have an intellectual countenance madam he said and i think you're capable of appreciating my ideas there is a sad want of intellectuality in people here a profound indifference to those larger questions which no dixon i will not have a waxy potato how many times must i tell you there's a conspiracy in this house to give me waxy potatoes take away the plate sir i was about to observe madam that you have an intellectual countenance and are i doubt not here dixon's arrival with his plate again broke the thread of the elderly gentleman's discourse and he branched off into a complaint against the administration for its unjust distribution of gravy and then began again and kept on beginning again with trifling variation of phrase till the end of dinner after dinner jane howlett the nurse bore elizabeth away to her own apartment but here she had now a piano on which she played for hours together all the old dreamy mendelssohn and chopin music which she had played long ago in those dull days at the vicarage when all her life had been a dream of malcolm ford she played now as she had played then weaving her thoughts into the music and slowly 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 the curtain was lifted sense and memory came back until one day she remembered that she was lord paulyn's wife and that there was an impassable gulf between her and the man she loved so one morning when dr cameron going his weekly round with mr burley in attendance on him asked her the old question about her husband in his gentle fatherly voice she no longer looked up at him with vague wonder in her eyes but looked downward with a sad smile a smile in which there was thought my husband she repeated slowly no i do not want to see him ours was not a happy marriage he was always very good to me let me have my own way in most things only i couldn't be happy with him i used to think that kind of life a fine lady's life must be happiness but i was punished for my folly it didn't make me happy this was by far the most reasonable speech she had uttered since she left slogner dyack 
but dr cameron looked at his assistant with a pensive smile still very rambling he murmured and then he patted elizabeth's head with his gentlemanly hand you must try to get well my dear lady he said compose yourself and collect your thoughts and don't talk too much and then i shall soon be able to write to your good kind husband and tell him that you are better don't you think he'll be pleased to hear that i don't know answered elizabeth moodily if he cared very much he would hardly have left me here my dear lady your coming here was unavoidable and see what good it has done you good she cried with a wild look you don't know what i've suffered in the horrible room locked in with those brutal women good why between them they drove me mad this speech cost elizabeth a melancholy entry in the physician's notebook very little improvement ideas wild delusion about nurses continues the weekly festive gatherings at which she was now permitted to assist were not enlivening to lady paulyn's spirits she sat on a bench against the wall watching the dancers who really seemed to enjoy themselves in their diverse manners except miss chiffinch who was not terpsichorean and who sat in her corner and moaned for her mamma and miss pocock who even in the midst of the caledonians buttonholed her fellow dancers in order to inform them that her sisters were so happy mr burley himself assisted at these weekly dances in white kid gloves and as long as things went tolerably well made believe that the dancers were quite up to the mark and on a level with dancers in the outside world everything was done ceremoniously the orchestra consisted of a harp fiddle and clarionet all played by servants of the establishment mr burley danced with all the more distinguished ladies curious-looking matrons in high caps and china crepe shawls whose gloves were too large for them but this was a peculiarity of everybody's gloves being bought for them by the heads of the house with no special reference to size he asked elizabeth to dance the first set with him but she declined i never dance at servants balls she said it's all very well to look on for half an hour but i should think they would enjoy themselves more if one kept away altogether oh, but this is not a servant's ball oh what is it then mr burley was rather at a loss for a reply um a friendly little dance he said i've got up to amuse you all but it doesn't amuse me at all i don't know any of these people they've not been introduced to me i thought it was a servant's party oh mr burley do please let me go home exclaimed miss pocock swooping down upon the superintendent i do so want to go home my sisters are so happy i tell you what it is melinda miss pocock's name was melinda and being youthful she was usually addressed by her christian name if you don't behave yourself properly you shall be sent to bed home indeed why you'll have to stop here another twelve months if you go on bothering everybody like this oh, mr burley and my sisters are so happy there'll be tarts and negus presently won't there perhaps if you behave yourself well, then i will but my sisters are so happy mr burley pushed her away with a friendly push and she was presently absorbed in the whirlpool of a set of lancers and was informing people of her sister's happiness to the tune of when the heart of a man is oppressed with care the house surgeon was more interested in lady paulyn than in miss melinda pocock who was the youngest daughter of an essex farmer idle selfish greedy and troublesome and by no means a profoundly interesting case he talked to elizabeth for a little talk seriously and found her answers grow more reasonable as he went on did she remember scotland and her house there oh yes she told him with a shudder she hated the house but she loved the country the hills and the wide lakes and the great sea beyond i should like to live out upon those hills alone all the rest of my life she said <laughs> 
you must get well and go back there in the summer oh, not to that house to a cottage among the hills a cottage of my own where i could live by myself i'll never go back to that house and the people in it but why do you all talk to me about getting well there's nothing the matter with me or at least only my tiresome cough which will be well soon enough End of Book 3, Chapter 15 Book 3, Chapter 16 of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book 3, Chapter 16 Peace to his soul, if God's good pleasure be. Three weeks had gone by since Dr. Cameron had written to Lord Paulyn, and Malcolm Ford still waited to hear the result of that application. He went on with his own particular work quietly enough in the meanwhile, did the heaviest part of the asthmatic curate's duty, read to all the bedridden cottagers within six miles of Heatheridge, went up to London every now and then to see his friends of the Gospel Society, and thus kept himself acquainted with all that was being done for the progress of that great work to which he had given his life, and so lived a not altogether empty or futile existence even during this period of self-abnegation. He had to attend a meeting in town one morning while still waiting for Lord Paulyn's letter, and finding his business finished at one o'clock, went straight to Eaton Place to call upon Miss Luttrell. He had heard from Dr. Cameron a day or two before, to the effect that there had been no answer from Lord Paulyn, but it was just possible Gertrude herself might have received a letter that very morning. The letter must come sooner or later, he thought, with some explanation of the delay which seemed so heartless. The Eaton Place man of all work, the man who had given Mr. Ford the ticket for the amateur theatricals at the Rancho, had rather a doubtful air when he asked to see Miss Luttrell. Mrs. Chevenix and Miss Luttrell were at home, he said, but he hardly thought they would see anybody. Miss Luttrell will not refuse to see me, said Mr. Ford, giving the man his card. Oh, it's not that. I know you, sir. Only I'm afraid there's something wrong. But I'll take your name in. He carried the card into the dining room and reappeared immediately to usher Mr. Ford in after it. Mrs. Chevenix and her eldest niece were at luncheon, that is to say, the usual array of edibles, the snug little hot-water dish of cutlets, the imported pie in a crockery crust, the crisp Passover biscuits, Stilton cheese, dry sherry, silver chocolate pot and other vanities, had been duly set forth for Mrs. Chevenix's delectation. But that lady sat gazing absently at these preparations, with consternation written upon her countenance. Gertrude, who also sat idle at the other end of the table, was in the act of shedding tears. "'What is the matter?' Mr. Ford asked with an alarmed tone. "'Had there been ill news from Heatheridge in his absence? His heart sank at the thought. Oh, but surely that could not be. He had inquired of the woman at the lodge that very morning, and had heard a good account of the patient. He had made this lodge-keeper his friend, bought her fidelity at a handsome price at the very beginning of things, and so had been able to obtain tidings every day. The two ladies sighed dolefully, but said nothing. There was an open letter lying beside Gertrude's plate, a letter edged with black. The letter from Lord Paulyn, he thought. That nobleman must still be in mourning for his mother. "'Have you heard from Rome?' he asked Gertrude. "'And does he forbid you seeing your sister? Can he be cruel enough, wicked enough to do that?' "'We have had no letter from Lord Paulyn, and I must beg you not to speak in that impetuous way about my poor nephew-in-law,' said Mrs. Chevenix. "'Lord Paulyn is in heaven.' Malcolm Ford looked at her wonderingly. The phrase seemed almost meaningless at first. "'Yes, it's very dreadful,' said Gertrude. "'But it's only too true. "'I'm sure it seems like a dream. "'He was not a kind brother-in-law to me, "'and I have very little advantage from such a splendid connection. 
except perhaps being more looked up to and deferred to in Hawley society. The same people that asked us to spend the evening before Elizabeth's marriage asked us to dinner afterwards. Beyond that, I had nothing to thank Lord Paulyn for. But still, it seems so dreadful to be snatched away like that, and only thirty-four. And I fear that after the sadly worldly life he led here, he'll find the change to a better world disappointing. What do you mean? asked Mr. Ford. Is Lord Paulyn dead? Yes, sighed Gertrude. The letter came this morning from his lawyer. He died at Rome last Thursday, after only a week's illness. He'd been hunting in the Campagna, his lawyer says, and caught cold, but refused to stay indoors and nurse himself as his valet wanted him to do. And the next morning he woke in a high fever, and the landlord of the hotel sent for a doctor, an Italian, who bled him every other day to keep down the fever. But he grew rapidly worse and died on Thursday morning, just as his servant began to get frightened and was going to call in an English doctor. The lawyer's very angry, and says he must have been murdered by that Italian doctor. It seems very dreadful. It will be in the morning post tomorrow, said Mrs. Chevenix solemnly. I shouldn't be surprised if they give him half a column edged with black, like a prime minister. I suppose it would be a mockery to offer you luncheon, Mr. Ford, she went on in a dreary voice. Those cutlets a la soubise are sure to be good. You won't? Oh, well, then we may as well go up to the drawing-room. Oh, give me a glass of sherry, Gertrude. I haven't touched a morsel of anything since breakfast. So they went upstairs to the drawing-room, that room whose various trifles, the fernery, the celadon china, the lobsters and other sea vermin in modern majolica ware, reminded Malcolm Ford of that bitter day when he had tried to cast Elizabeth Luttrell out of his heart as entirely as he had banished her from his life. "'It seems like a dream,' said Gertrude, wiping away a tributary tear, and appeared to think that in this novel remark she had expressed all that could possibly be said about Lord Paulyn's untimely death. "'We shall all have to go into mourning,' she went on presently. "'So near Ashcombe, of course, it would be impossible to avoid it. And I don't suppose he's left us anything for mourning. Dying so suddenly, he wouldn't be likely to think of it. And the summer coming on, too, with our dusty roads. Positively ruinous for mourning. He is to be brought home to Ashcombe, said Mrs. Chevenix. And poor Elizabeth, not able to be at the funeral. So sad, and her absence so likely to be noticed in the papers. They babbled on about funerals and mourning, and will or no will, while Malcolm Ford sat silent, really like one whose brain is entangled in the mazes of some wild dream. Dead! The last, remotest possibility he could have dreamed of. Dead! And Elizabeth set free. Free for him to watch over, for him to cherish, for him to win slowly back to reason and to love. He thought of her that night at Dunallen, that bitter night, in which temptation assailed him in the strongest form that ever the tempter wore for erring man's destruction, when she had stretched out her arms to him and pleaded, Keep me with you, Malcolm, keep me with you. And he had longed with a wild longing to clasp her to his breast and carry her away to some secure haven of secrecy and loneliness, and defy the world and heaven and hell for her sake. Brief but sharp had been the struggle, few the tears he had shed, but the tears a strong man sheds in such a moment are tears of blood. And behold, now she was free. He might say to her, Dearest, I will keep you and guard you for ever, and even if the lost light never comes back again, if those sweet eyes must see me for ever dimly through a cloud of troubled thoughts, I may still be your guardian, your companion, your brother, your friend. But she would recover. He had Dr. Cameron's assurance of that. She would recover. 
god would give her back to life and to reason and to him how strange and new seemed that wondrous prospect of happiness like a sudden break in a leaden storm-cloud flooding all the world with sunshine like an opening in a wood revealing a fair summer landscape new to the gaze of the traveller fairer than all that he had ever seen upon earth almost as lovely as his dreams of heaven he sat speechless in this wonderful crisis of his life not daring to thank god for this blessing since it came to him by so dread a means by the sudden cutting off of a man who had never injured him and for whose untimely death he should have felt some natural christian-like regret but he could not bring himself to consider his dead rival he could only think of his own new future a future which would give back to him all he had surrendered a future which would recompense him a thousandfold even in this lower life for every sacrifice of inclination for every renunciation of self-interest that he had made it was not his theory that man's works should be rewarded in this life but earthly things are apt to be sweet even to a christian and to malcolm ford to-day it seemed that to win back the woman he had loved to begin again from that unforgotten starting point when he had held her in his arms under the march moonlight the star-like eyes looking up at him full of unspeakable love to recommence existence thus was to be young again young in a world as new as eden was to adam when he woke in the dewy morning and beheld his helpmeet and tonga taboo and the infantine souls who wanted to worship him as their god the dusky chiefs who made war upon each other and roasted each other alive upon occasion only for the want of knowing better and who were prompt to confess that the god of the christians not exacting human sacrifice or self-mutilation must needs be a good fellow what of these and all those other heathen in the unexplored corners of the earth to which he was to have carried the cross of christ was he ready to renounce these at a breath for the sake of his earthly love no no a thousand times no love and duty should go hand in hand his wife should go with him should help him in his sacred work he would know how to leave her in some secure shelter when the path he trod was perilous he would expose her to no danger but she might be near him always and sometimes with him and might help him in his labours might serve the great cause even by her beauty and brightness as birds and flowers lovely useless things as we may deem them swell the universal hymn wherewith god's creatures praise their creator all these thoughts were in his mind vistas of happiness to come stretching in dazzling vision far away into the distant future while he sat silent like a man spellbound hearing and yet not hearing the voice of mrs chevenix as she held forth at length upon the difference between real property and personal property in relation to a widow's thirds and the supreme folly the almost idiocy sad token of future derangement which elizabeth had shown in objecting to a marriage settlement hmm. air presumptive said mrs chevenix referring to burke whose crimson bound volume lay open close at hand captain paulin r n born january eighteen twenty eight married october eighteen forty nine sarah jane third daughter of john henry towser esq of west hackney middlesex imagine a tutney hackney naval man inheriting that vast wealth and perhaps elizabeth left almost a pauper if that sweet child had only lived but there has seemed a fate against that poor girl from the first what will be her feelings when she recovers her senses poor child and is told she is only a dowager even the diamonds i suppose will have to go to sarah jane third daughter of john henry tower with ineffable disgust as her nearest relation you will now have the right to see your sister without any one's permission said mr ford to gertrude slowly awakening from that long dream she has ceased to belong to any one but you will you come up to hetheridge to-morrow morning gertrude 
he had called her by her christian name throughout this time of trouble and to-day it seemed as if she were already his sister he was eager to think and act for her to do everything that might hasten the hour of elizabeth's release i will come if you like only um, there's the morning we can't be too quick about that they may ask us to the funeral they who your brother-in-law had no near relations there will only be lawyers and the new viscount interested in this business let the dead bury their dead you have your sister to think of could you not send for blanche your sister expressed a desire to see blanche i've been thinking i might find you a furnished house at heatheridge there's a pretty little cottage on the outskirts of the village which i am told is usually let to strangers in summer if i could get that for you now you'd be close at hand and could see your sister daily i have had a good deal of friendly talk with dr cameron and i am sure he will do all in his power to hasten her recovery may i try to secure the cottage for you gertrude looked at him curiously she was very pale and the eyes which had once been handsome eyes before time and disappointment had dimmed their lustre had brightened with an unusual light not a pleasant light you think of no one but elizabeth she said her voice trembling a little it's hardly respectful to the dead i think of the living whom i know more than of the dead whom i only saw for an hour or so once in my life that is hardly strange if you are indifferent to your sister's welfare at such a time as this i will not trouble you about her i can write to blanche she will come i dare say if i ask her blanche would come yes at the first bidding had she not been pestering her elder sister with piteous letters entreating to be allowed to come to london and see her darling lizzie whose madness she would never believe in it was all a plot of those horrid paulins gertrude knew very well that blanche would come you can take the cottage she said if it's not very expensive please remember we are poor you won't mind my going away will you aunt to be near elizabeth my dear gertrude how can you ask such a question exclaimed mrs chevenix expansively as if i should for a moment allow any selfish desire of mine to stand between you and poor elizabeth she said this with real feeling for gertrude was not a vivacious companion and her society had for some time been oppressive to mrs chevenix it's no small trial for an elderly lady with a highly cultivated selfishness to have to share her dainty little luncheons and careful little dinners her decanter of manzanilla and her cup of choicest mocha with a person who is neither profitable nor entertaining a mr foljam the lawyer a person in gray's inn promises to call to-morrow said mrs chevenix presently i suppose we shall hear all the sad particulars from him and about the will if there is a will in the question of the will mr ford felt small interest was he not rich enough for both rich enough to go back to those sunny isles in the southern sea with his sweet young wife to bear him company rich enough to build her a pleasant home in that land where before very long if he so chose he might write himself down as bishop all his desires were bounded by the hope of her speedy recovery and release he could go to dr cameron now with a bold affront could tell the kindly physician that brief and common story which the doctor had perhaps guessed at ere now could venture to say to him i have watched over and cared for her not only because i was her father's friend and remember her in her bright youth but because i have loved her as well as ever a woman was loved upon this earth end of book three chapter sixteen Book three, chapter seventeen of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book three, chapter seventeen.
the widest land doom takes to part us leaves thy heart in mine with pulses that beat double what i do and what i dream include thee as the wine must taste of its own grapes and when i sue god for myself he hears that name of thine and sees within my eyes the tears of two the cottage was hired a little rustic box of a place containing four rooms and a kitchen with a lean-to roof a habitation just redeemed from absolute commonness by a prettily arranged garden a green porch and one bow window but gertrude who came to heatheridge with her worldly goods in a cab declared the place charming worthy of mr ford's excellent taste this was before noon of the day after malcolm heard of lord paulyn's death he had lost no time but had taken the cottage engaged the woman who kept it to act as servant seen dr cameron who had that morning received a letter from mr foljam the lawyer and was inexpressibly shocked at the event which it announced and had wrung from him a somewhat reluctant consent to the sisters seeing each other on the following day there is a marked improvement yes i may venture to say a decided improvement but lady paulyn is hardly as well as i could wish the mind still wanders nor is the physical health all i could desire oh but that doubtless will be benefited by milder weather and freedom said malcolm ford eagerly elizabeth's soul is too wild a bird not to languish in a cage give her back to the scenes of her youth and the free air of heaven and i will be responsible for the completion of her cure you will not tell her of her husband's death yet awhile i suppose i think not the shock might be too great in her present weak condition three o'clock in the afternoon was the hour dr cameron appointed for the interview and at half-past two mr ford called at the cottage he had promised to take gertrude to the park gate and to meet her in the heatheridge road on her return so that he might have early tidings of the interview it was a balmy afternoon in early spring the leafless elms faintly stirred by one of those mild west winds which march sometimes steals from his younger brother april an afternoon of sunshine and promise which cheats the too hopeful soul with the fond delusion that summer was not very far off that equinoctial gales are done with and the hawthorn blossom ready to burst through the russet brown of the hedgerows heatheridge is a spot beautiful even in winter essentially beautiful in spring when the undulating pastures that slope away from the crest of the hill down to the very edge of the distant city are clothed in their freshest verdure and dotted with wild purple crocuses which flourish in profusion on some of the heatheridge pastures heatheridge has as yet escaped the builders half a dozen country houses for the most part of the william and mary period are scattered along the rural looking road a few more clustered near the green shops there are none only a village inn with sweet-smelling white-curtained bedchambers and humble sanded parlours and a row of cottages an avenue of ancient elms and a village church to close the vista at the church gates the road makes a sudden wind and descends the hill gently still keeping high above the distant city and the broad valley between to the gates of heatheridge park this bright afternoon seems a good omen said malcolm ford as he and gertrude came near this gate oh dear mr ford surely you are not superstitious exclaimed gertrude with a shocked air superstitious no but one is cheered by the sunshine i am glad the sun will shine on your first meeting with your sister think of her gertrude a prisoner on this lovely day oh, but she's not a prisoner in the slightest degree don't you remember dr cameron told us she was to have carriage airings yes to be driven out with other patients i suppose for a stiff little drive i don't think elizabeth would mistake that for liberty this is the gate i'll leave you to find your own way to the house i have no permission to cross the boundary you will find me here when you come back he waited a long hour his imagination following gertrude into that old red-brick mansion 
his fancy seeing the face he loved almost as vividly as he had seen it with his bodily eyes that night at Dunallen. What would be the report? Would she strike Gertrude strangely as a changed creature, not the sister she had known a year or two ago, but a being divided from her by a great gulf, distant, unapproachable, strange as the shadowy semblance of the very dead? It was an hour of unspeakable anxiety. All his future life seemed now to hang upon what Gertrude should tell him when she came out of that gate. At first he had walked backwards and forwards for a distance of about a quarter of a mile by the park fence. Later he could not do this, so eagerly did he expect Gertrude's return, but stood on the opposite side of the road with his back against a stile, watching the gate. She came out at last walking slowly with her veil down. His watch told him that she had been just a few minutes more than an hour. His heart would have made him believe that he had waited half a day. She did not see him, and was walking toward the village when he crossed the road and placed himself by her side. "'Well?' he cried eagerly. Oh, "'Tell me everything, for God's sake. Did she know you? Was she pleased to see you? Did she talk reasonably, like her old self?' Gertrude did not answer immediately. He repeated his question. For God's sake, tell me! Yes, she said, not looking up. She knew me, and seemed rather pleased, and talked of our old life at Hawley, and poor papa, and was very reasonable. I don't think there is much the matter with her mind. Thank God, thank God! I knew he would be good to us, I knew he would listen to our prayers. And she is better, nearly well. Oh, God bless that good Dr. Cameron. I was inclined to hate him at first, and to think that he meant to lock her up and hide her from us all the days of her life. But he only did what was right, and he has cured her. Gertrude, why do you keep your veil down like that, and your head bent so that I can't see your face? There's nothing to be unhappy about now that she's so much better. If she knew you and talked to you reasonably of the past, she must be very much better. You should be as glad as I am, as grateful for God's mercy to us. He took hold of her arm, trying to look into her face, but she turned away from him and burst into a passion of weeping. She's dying, she said at last. I saw death in her face. She's dying, and I have helped to kill her. Dying? Elizabeth, dying? He uttered the words mechanically, like a man half stunned by a terrible blow. She's dying, Gertrude repeated with passionate persistence. Dr. Cameron may talk of her being only a little weak and getting well again when the mild weather comes. But she will never live to see the summer. Those hollow cheeks, those bright, bright eyes, they pierced me to the heart. That was how Mamma looked, just like that, a few months before she died, just like Elizabeth today. That little worrying cough, those hot, dry hands, oh, all the dreadful signs I know so well. Oh, Mr. Ford, for God's sake, don't look at me like that, with that dreadful look in your face. You make me hate myself worse than ever, and I've hated myself bitterly enough ever since... Ever since what? he asked, with a sudden searching look in his eyes, his face white as the face of death. Had he not just received his death blow, or the more cruel death blow of all his sweet newborn hopes, his new life? Ever since what? he repeated sternly. She cowered and shrank before him, looking at the ground and trembling like some hunted animal. Since I tried to part you and Elizabeth, she said, I, I suppose it was very wicked, though I wrote only the truth. But everything's gone wrong with us since then. It seemed as if I had let loose a legion of troubles. You tried to part us? You wrote only the truth. What? Then the anonymous letter that sowed the seeds of my besotted jealousy was your writing? 
it was the truth word for word as i heard it from frederick melvin and you wrote an anonymous letter the meanest vilest form which malice ever chooses for its cowardly assault to part your sister and her lover may i ask miss luttrell what i had done to deserve this from you that i will never tell you she said looking up at him for the first time doggedly i will not trouble you for your reasons you did what you could to poison my life and perhaps your sister's and now you tell me she is dying but she shall not die he cried passionately if prayer and love can save her i will wrestle for my darling as jacob wrestled with the angel i will supplicate day and night i will give her the best service of my heart and brain if science and care and limitless love can save her she shall be saved but i think you had better go back to devonshire miss luttrell and let me have your sister blanche for my ally it was not your letter that parted us however i was not quite weak enough to be frightened by any anonymous slander it was my own hot-headed folly or your sister's fatal pride that severed us only i should hardly like to have you about her after what you have told me there would be something too much of judas in the business oh mr ford how hard you are towards me and i acted for the best said gertrude whimpering i thought i was only doing my duty towards you i felt so sure that you and elizabeth were unsuited to each other that she could never make you happy pray who taught you to take the measure of my capacity for happiness cried mr ford with sudden passion your sister was the only woman who ever made me happy he checked himself remembering that this was treason against that gentler soul he had loved and lost the only woman who ever made me forget everything in this world except herself the only woman who could have kept me a bond-slave at her feet who could have put a distaff in my hand and made me false to every purpose of my life but that is all past now and if god gives her back to me i will serve him as truly as i love her oh say that you forgive me dear mr ford pleaded gertrude in a feeble piteous voice you can't despise me more than i despise myself and yet i acted with the belief that i was only doing my duty it seemed right for you to know i used to think it over in church even and it seemed only right that you should know oh, do say you forgive me say that i forgive you cried mr ford bitterly what is the good of my forgiveness can it undo the great wrong you did if that letter parted us if it turned the scale by so much as a feather's weight i forgive you freely enough i despise you too much to be angry oh that is very cruel do you expect to gather grapes from the thorns you planted be content if the thorn has not stung you to death oh, but you'll let me stay won't you mr ford and see my poor sister as often as dr cameron will allow me remember i was not obliged to confess this to you i might have kept my secret for ever you would never have suspected me hardly i knew it was a woman's work but i could not think it was a sister's i told you of my own free will blackened myself in your eyes and if you are so hard upon me where can i expect compassion let me stay and do what i can to be a comfort to elizabeth how can i be sure that you are sincere that you really wish her well you may be planning another anonymous letter you may consider it your duty to come between us again what with my sister on the brink of the grave cried gertrude bursting into tears tears which seemed the outpouring of a genuine grief so be it then you shall stay and i will try to forget you ever did that mean and wicked act you forgive me as i hope god has already forgiven you end of book 3 chapter 17